This is Emily Thomas interviewing Lexia Tomlinson on the 18th of October 2017 at her house in Birmingham. Lexia was born in 1994 in Hanover, Lucia, uh, Jamaica, and migrated to Birmingham in 2000. Can you tell me, can you tell me about your family background? Um, hello, yes, so my family originate in Jamaica and we're a mixture of uh, farmland owners and just working, general working. Um, some people are indigenous to the Caribbean and then some are Spanish and Scottish, so it's a weird kind of mix of heritage going on there. Can you tell me about where you lived in Jamaica? Oh, that was cool. So I lived lots of places. So I lived in Mount Peace, which is the countryside um, part. And going to school, getting up for school was like a mission. You had to get up at like 4 a.m. to catch like the one taxi man down into the city. Then we also lived in uh, Lucy, which is like a small town inside Hanover. And then I lived... I think it was out in Montego Bay, which is where most people are kind of familiar with because of the tourism. Um, like, down in, like, this foresty part. I'm not sure. Addresses are really weird. And I was, like, there in the 90s, so... But I think things, like, straight now. Can you tell me about your memories from your early childhood before you moved to the UK? Um, most of my memories uh, revolve around going fishing with my brother and sister, um, on like doing like treks and stuff. So we used to go to the beach a lot and the river. Um, so when we lived up in the countryside, there's like this place called uh, Blue Lagoon. And I, unless you're a local, you don't know how to get there. I would not know how to get there right now. Um, and we'd like go trekking after church on Sundays to the lagoon and it was just always continuously blue. And they told me like this myth about someone using too much cake soap, which is like this kind of, um, blue soap that people use to like wash things and make them like immaculately white and they were like yeah someone just left loads of them in the bottom of the river and that's why it's that colour um, and then going to school and stuff so I was there till grade two um, I just remember like the uniforms and everything having to be so pristine the lunchtime cues and how you would like I don't how do you They'd give them breaks at different times, and my older siblings were older than me, so I always used to remember trying to, like, go around to their part, and they're like, no, you have to stay in the kids' bit, and then trying to learn all the clapping games. And I have no rhythm, so that was always interesting. And just, I don't know, really, really good times. So just all the fond, good stuff of being a kid, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about your siblings? Yes, yeah, so I have um, two older sisters and an older brother. So obviously this is recording, so no one will be able to see. Um, my oldest brother, he's a chef, so he like loves cooking and stuff. Um, my other sister, she was in the army. And she went off when she was like 18. Um, and then my other sister is like doing, studying beauty and stuff. They're all like 10, 9 and 7 years older than me. Um, I just remember like idolizing them and following them around a lot when I was a kid and like wanting them to play with me and then I'm just annoying and they're like I want my own space so yeah no they're cool people to have as role models. Uh, can you tell me about why you migrated to Birmingham? Mm -hmm. um, it was economic migration so my mom um, was a single parent by the time I came along and she always wanted a better life for us and a better standard of education. So she actually left when I think I was five, I think. And I, um, one of the reasons I moved around so much is because I lived with different members of my family. So I lived with my uncle, an aunt, that's not really an aunt, but you call everyone auntie <laughs> or uncle, and um, other relatives. And then she lived here for a year on her own while she got uh, settled economically. And she lived all about, so she lived in like London, uh, King's Standing, uh, with other family members. And she like got herself educated and then took us over. So uh, can you tell me about um, the family members that you already had living in Birmingham? Um, I think 
it was my mum's half brother. Um, we saw them a lot when I was a kid, not so much now. Um, my great uncle, which was her, my mum's uncle, um, he recently passed away. Um, then we had lots of cousins that we see infrequently uh, a couple of times now. Can you tell me about your first memories of Birmingham? Paint me a picture of what it was like. Oh, so we didn't always live here. We lived um, in the other part of Perry Bar, so down by Alexander Stadium. Um, so I lived in Pendragon Road, actually. And I think one of the most distinct first memories is like I had two old ladies as neighbours on the other side. And they just always like used to give me and my sister ice creams over the fence, and I was like, "What?" Um, and then we also lived onto the back of um, Perry Park, so there was like fences. We could just like climb through into the park. So when it closed up at dusk, the entire park is your playground. So that was pretty amazing. But the most vivid first memory is when we first moved here, and snow. I think we have pit. I have pictures actually, and it was snowing, and I I don't think I'd ever seen snow before outside of films, and I'm really weird in regards to like how I feel cold and whatnot, and I'm just there in like a pair of shorts, a summer hat, and a t-shirt, just playing in the snow, like rolling around. My mom's like, "What?" <laughs> and I'm just like, "It's great! It's snow!" <laughs> so yeah, that's that's my favorite thing about moving here, like. I miss the snow, man. Where's the good snow? Yeah. And so can you tell me about how the transition was for you from moving from Jamaica to Birmingham? Um, I didn't... It didn't impact me at first because I moved here in the summer as a kid, so I didn't have to start school yet. And I was just with my older sister so my mom took me and her first and then my other sister and brother um got left behind um and it was me and my older sister my mom and my stepdad and um yeah it was just like adapting into just being a normal family unit uh enjoying the summer playing um but once I had to start school that's when like oh my god you're in a different place these are different people I went from like having my set core group of friends who I knew who knew me since we were like in kindergarten to all these kids being like oh your accent's so weird why are you wearing ribbons what is that all about and I remember this girl in year six just kept on coming up to me every break time and she was like, oh, are you American? I would be like, no, I'm Jamaican. And she's like, but you sound American. Why Why are you lying? And I'm like, but I'm not. And it's just things like that. It's just effort and time consuming when you just want to adapt. And obviously schools was different too. So when I lived there, they still had corporal punishment. So if you were late, like, you'd get hit but not like badly, but like with a ruler or a cane and stuff. And um, the level of respect was a weird one to adapt to. Um, Kids just being rude, I'd I'd never seen it. Like you just have this, because you have to pay for school. So you have a level of, oh my God, I'm very fortunate. I'm lucky to get an education. There are kids who don't get this. And you know from young age that is how you prosper in society. To kids being like, okay, you get school free, you have all this technology, all this equipment, all these toys, and you're being rude, and you're not grateful, and you don't care. And I was like, whoa, what a kind of world am I in? So yeah, that was that was hard to adapt to. Can you tell me about uh, very broadly about your primary school experience? So what you enjoyed and didn't enjoy? Um, I really enjoyed learning. Um, I, I just like knowing things, We're really curious, like how things work. So it doesn't matter the subject, I'll be like, yes, maybe maths, okay, maybe maths, we're not friends. <laughs> um, but like sciences, arts and stuff, it was great. My school had um, a, a good funding, so we had lots of facilities and trips or people coming in. 
um, and it exposed me to a lot of cultures and stuff. So I remember like, I didn't, I just, when I was a child, I assumed everyone was Christian. <laughs> so I, I didn't know that people were different things. So getting to go to places like Gudwaras, um, learning about Sikhism, um, at Judaism and stuff like that was really cool. And just understanding that people just people, they just worship different faiths. Um, so it was nice being exposed to that. Um, making friends was, was nice. Obviously, everyone, everyone wants friends. Um, and just, ooh, just getting involved inside my community. But there were also other aspects that weren't great. Um, so in year four, uh, I started getting picked on by this new girl. It continued for like two years, um, all the way till year six, which caused my behavior to like spiral. I'd like retaliate and have tantrums or like screaming and stuff. And obviously that didn't help my case, but if the school's not helping you, you just take matters into your own hands sometimes. Um, so that part, obviously put like a gray cloud on my school experience. And I, my name's Lexia. And like sometimes I'd like walk home on my own and just remember everyone's be like, oh, Lola Lex again. And I'd just be like, okay. But it taught me to be resilient and appreciate my own company. So there's that. Do you have any particularly vivid memories of your primary school education or your childhood in Birmingham? Um, I loved our music teacher, Mrs. Vanelli. She was an amazing lady and she would um, teach us handwriting as well as music. Um, and then I remember just all the instruments. She, we had this like really like well-equipped music room and we had like, um, I remember having, I think it's rain drums, those big drums and then just, just playing with them. And I remember every assembly just being on the floor and then like us all having to sing um, the plants and the creatures in his heads and just all the songs. So it's, yeah, if I could sum up primary school, it'd be sitting in a hall with hundreds of other children doing shapes with our hands and just, yeah. And then finally getting to sit on the benches at the back when you're in your six, <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me about the transition then from your primary education to your secondary education in Birmingham? Mm -hmm. um, so secondary school was so much better. It was great. I, I loved high school. Um, it was weird how I got there. So um, the boy who lives up the road there and another boy who lives across the road, we were in the same primary class together. And I took my 11 plus exams so I wanted to go to grammar school, so I applied to Hampstead, Sutton Girls, and there's another one I can't remember. But all my details got lost in the post. I, they didn't even say, like, even for the normal schools, they were like, we can't find your record, we can't find the boy across the road, and we can't find the other boy. And we were just like, what the hell? What? 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 And, like, no one had told us until, like, halfway through the processes when nearly all the schools had been filled up. And the one school that I did get offered, um, at the time, they had such a terrible reputation in the city. And my mum was like, no, this is terrible. And I'm just like, ah. Oh. And I'd, like, got really good grades. I'd studied hard for my uh, SATs. And I was like, and I crammed. Because you have to cram really hard to do your oven plus. And I was like, no, my life's ruined. What's going on? Um, but when I got to the school that I got to, so I ended up, so they changed their name three times when I got there. Um, so it was initially college high. And it was College High Specialist Art School, and I think now it's North Birmingham Academy. Um, but I remember the first assembly in year seven, and they had a new head teacher. And they're like, we're gonna, we're gonna rebrand ourselves. We're gonna do things from scratch. And I remember Miss Propagniak standing there, and she's like, by the time you guys graduate, we're gonna turn things around. And they genuinely did. We had so many great opportunities, especially when they had art status. Um, just being exposed to such wonderful things like getting front row tickets for the Apollo for Wicked and then dancing with the chorus, um, having gifted and talented program, which I was in for like 
I don't know, so it was compulsory to do music, dance, oh God help me, <laughs> dance, um, drama, and all of those things up until year nine whilst doing your normal subjects, having practitioners come in, um, all the sports club, there are swimming pool, just, just all the amenities and support. And because I'd been bullied in primary school, um, helping to do campaigns like the Diana Trust Award and genuinely trying, obviously never going to eradicate bullying fully in schools, but trying to set up means which can help other people. Um, yeah, no, I just really loved it. I got involved, made some solid friends who are still my friends like 11 years later. So no, it's good, it's good. <laughs> Do you have any um, particularly vivid memories of you and your friends hanging out together? Um, there was always the courts. So our school had, I think, two basketball courts. Um, and I think by year nine, everybody would just be like, yeah, at lunchtime in our year group. Like, no one was like, cool, as in like, cool. But like, you had some people who were like, yeah they're on the inn so you just be like yeah I'm gonna go hang out at the court so I'm just like I just remember like all of us like lined up along the fence just like looking at everyone like just shooting hoops and like there was this one time my friend she came in with um brand new skull candy headphones and I just remember standing in the middle of the center pitch and like having it on and he's just like blasted the music and I'm just like, I can't hear anything else but the music. I can see everything going on. And I'm just like, this is a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about um, the academic aspects of school that you enjoyed then as you went through secondary school? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I, I loved it all learning wise. Um, I excelled in uh, the language part of things and science. So, um, we did a lot of poetry workshops, English language and writing and the speaking and listening aspect. And then um, for science, I just loved doing the experiments. So it was like, if you're in, um, so everything was in sets. So we had uh, set one, set two, set three, and set four. I was in set one for everything except maths, set two, <laughs> but I'm terrible at maths. Um, and then, yeah, we just, we got to do so much. Like, I, I think if you're in the lower sets, they didn't let you do the experiments and stuff because they didn't trust the kids. I don't know why. I think if you don't like being an auditory learner, being able to do things kinesthetically would have actually helped them more. Um, but yeah, we had some really good teachers who put the extra effort in except in year 10 when before our GCSEs our science teacher left and we had to teach ourselves for 10 months but that's a different story but yeah no can you tell me about your interests outside of secondary school um some of my interests aligned so like drama um I started first act workshops in I think year 9 or year 10 um, and that's a drama training ground for young people um, as young as 10, I think, to 25. So I still do it now, actually. I'm going to it after this interview. <coughs> um, and in that, we put on shows and we're also affiliated with charities. So we're with, whenever we have shows at the theatre and uh, we have paying guests, we donate all of our... Um, costs a uh, funding oh uh, no what's the word profits that's the one we donate all of our profits back to the charities um and i've been doing it for like 10 years now so i obviously love it um and i've met so many like cool people but if some people go away for uni or things like that or they just don't want to do it anymore it can get a bit weird like getting used to someone being like intense friends with them for like a term a year or however long you're there together and then they're gone and it's like oh i'm gonna have to make new friends this wednesday so yeah adapting to that but training i think it's made me a much better actor and person because i used to be very shy <laughs> um cripplingly so like if people came to the house and it wasn't 
um, anyone I knew or had met them a long time, I'd just like hide in my room. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. Um, so drama helped get me out of my shell, and yeah, it's it's great. I I, I believe in the power of drama and the therapy behind it all, and just even if no one wants to be an actor, just the skills to be able to speak well or like hold your own in a space it is training that everyone needs to be exposed to um and then i also did youth parliament um for about three three or two years um and uh, yeah so i was really interested in politics and society and affecting change in our community um, and for that, you had to campaign like a real politician. So we did hustings. Uh, I went around different schools um, campaigning. I remember going to Hillcrest for the first time one time and just trying to win all the girls over with my marketing and like campaign leaflets and making posters and stuff. And uh, it was it was a, a brilliant experience in regards to getting to meet people from different um, socioeconomic and just general backgrounds. So yeah, you had kids who at, at like, I don't know, 14 knew they wanted to be an MP. And then some kids are just like doing it to get like extra credit for university. And some people who are like, I can change the world. Um, and then some people who are like, I don't know, relatively working class like I am. Then other kids who are like, loaded um and I think it helps me now uh, when I'm na navigating life and people can be very much like oh rich people are like this and this and that and I'm like well have you actually hung out with people in different social classes at the end of the day people all have different pressures on them and their motives are what they are so I think that's helped me to like see the world and people for who they are and I can kind of feel comfortable in most spaces so yeah what else did I do I did a lot of after school clubs that took us out so I did um uh football basketball and swimming and yeah playing other schools was was well, yeah it wasn't great because at that time they were trying to rebuild their reputation so like I remember in rounders, the school used to cheat all the time. And in basketball, um, the girls at Kingsbury's were giants compared to us. And they like push us and shove us around. And if we'd complain, our teacher's like, oh, we can't complain, can't say anything. And like, you guys are being rude. And it's like, well, they're being foul to us just because you're trying to rebuild your reputation through the name of how your students behave doesn't mean you should let us like be assaulted <laughs> physically um but yeah those are some of the things i did a lot of things but i just can't remember it's been it's been a while um, if i remember i'll be like hey i did that too but yeah i think it was like a random award my mom keeps around as well for some community project i did i, I don't know man <laughs> yeah um, with your uh, work through Youth Parliament, mm -hmm. um, can you tell me how your experience of migrating to Birmingham might have influenced that? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, what did it affect? Hmm. I need a moment to think about that one. This one stumped me. Um, it's a good question, um, but looking back I don't think um, being a migrant influenced me doing it um, but I remember at one of the annual sittings we met a young person that was a traveller and that's the first time I'd met someone from the travelling community and learning about their rights and how they can feel like outsiders in a society that they are technically a part of even though they just are transient I think that reminded me of that I didn't always belong to this city and the fact that how you get your seat is that you belong from somewhere so like you're either 
a Birmingham candidate, a Warsaw, Sully Hall, blah, blah, blah. And then you have nationals and then international. Um, but I've, like, because I've lived here for so long, I definitely feel like I'm part of this city and I'm just like, yeah. I'd, I'd more likely be like, yeah, I'm Brummie before I'm like, I'd say I'm British or I'm Jamaican, if that makes sense. Can you tell me about some of the campaigns you worked on while you were part of the group? Um, yeah, so we worked on a lot of amazing campaigns. We worked on See the Good Behind the Hood, which was trying to, so it was during the knife epidemic um, back in like 2000, yeah, about, about 2010, 2009, it was around then, it was like crazy, wasn't it? So, and then um, a lot of businesses had mosquitoes, which are these frequency um, bugs that they put on around. And if you're a certain age, only you can hear it because the decibels in your um, ears decrease as you get older. So um, it was there put in shops to deter truancy and hooliganism and whatnot. Um, but it was hurting a lot of babies and they could hear it and their parents would be shopping and you wouldn't understand or just young children out shopping in your life and you can't turn mosquitoes off. So you were basically targeting and terrorizing a general amount of the population under a certain age just because you assumed certain things about their behavior. And the campaign um, helped to get rid of those. Um, so they're illegal in Europe. You can't have them in shops anymore, which is a great win. And seeing the good behind the hood was also trying to tackle that appearances aren't always what they seem. Just because a kid has their hoodie up doesn't mean they're going to attack you. I mean, it's cold. We live in a cold country. Um, that's putting it simplistically, but that was the idea behind it. And then um, one of my favorite campaigns was um, putting the cap on tuition fees. So I believe it's the brainchild of James Greenhall. And it was, um, so we knew that the general election was coming up and that whoever came into power, you could rise, they would likely, most likely be rising the tuition fees. So what we had was um, these stickers that you put on pound coins and trying to get them into circulation. And it was like, put the cap on. Uh, we wrote to lots of members of parliament and to um, our local councils, trying to get it into schools and universities and get people to sign the petition so that the next incoming um, government couldn't rise tuition fees. Obviously that failed because we're all paying nine grand a year. Um, but I remember vividly um, when Centenary Square outside the rep was just there and we had a huge protest for it. And this man, he was walking past with his kids and they were, they couldn't have been anything more than like 10 or 12. And he's like fairly middle classy, but not enough to like fund all your kids to university. Um, and we were like, hey, can you sign this? And he's like, I don't need to sign this. It doesn't matter. And I'm like, I'm just thinking of all the people who were like that, who didn't care and didn't think the government were going to do anything and we're where we are now. So the failure of that campaign makes me really sad. Um, yeah. But um, one of my favourite memories was uh, debating in the House of Lord, not the House, the House of Commons. Um, so, yeah, we were all piled in there broadcast like it was news time yeah question time that's the one and just debating all the issues and it being broadcast out nationally and it's like okay here are these young people who care about the state of our country and we're politically engaged because that was one thing we always tried to get out there it's like young people genuinely care they might not be us but they're the people who had to go and vote for us. They're the other people who are talking about this. And we care about our city, our country, and the world. So what have you been up to since leaving school? Um, when I left school, I went straight to college. 
did my A-levels, so I did drama and theatre studies, English language and literature, film studies and geography. And everyone was like, geography, what? Um, <laughs> but I, I, I just like the world and it teaches you a lot. So you have to do human science as well. So you have to look at population rises, decreases, tectonic plates and river confluences and stuff. And then film studies, because I want to be an actor. Um, well, I am an actor, but, but um, and theatre studies. So it was just both sides of like the old, the new, and understanding how it all runs behind the scenes. And then the, the writing and aspect of things. And then, what was the other one? Theatre, language. Yeah, yeah, no, that's covered it all. Um, I didn't get as stuck in. Um, with inside um, inside college things because I was like I'd done so much in high school I remember coming home at like 11 o'clock because I'd have to be at meetings in the council house and I was like no I just want to be a teenager for these two years while we have such intense like subjects and stuff I have to do um, but I still got roped into a few projects um, so we had like community cleanups where we'd go out into the local area. So I went to JC, so I think that's near the Borsal Heath area, Small Heath area. So we'd like go out doing um, community cleanups, like picking up the trash, um, language clubs for like older citizens in the community who want to learn English as a second language and things like that. Um, and then helping with the prom committees to organize the dances and then um a theatre club as well and choir yeah so I didn't really succeed in not doing as much as I wanted to but it didn't feel as intense yeah and then I went to university um did a H&D instead of a full degree and now I'm working as I do retail uh, to pay the bills I'm a poet um done a few gigs well uh, quite a few and I'm also an actor I signed to an agency about four months after university so can you tell me a little bit more about um your uh experience with poetry and acting mm -hmm. um acting I knew I wanted to do it since I was 11 years old um my granddad died at that time and I couldn't go back home for the funeral because it was going to be our last leavers assembly. And my mum's like, you're never going to see any of your friends properly ever again. Um, so you may as well stay. Um, and you don't have drama teaching in primary school. And I just remember crying in the play and like using the emotions from that that you had to use. And everyone coming up to me afterwards and like, oh, that was fantastic and great. And like, Years later, after like when studying drama, I realized that was like Stanislavski's The Magic If. Um, but at the time, I was just like, oh my god. And then going to a school that did have specialist arts program, it was like being more and more immersed in it, joining the workshop inside. So being duly exposed, I was like, okay, I love this. So the more I learned about techniques, I was just like, this is an amazing art form, and I haven't like given up on it. Um, poetry was when I was doing my A-levels. We'd, we'd done it at GCSEs, but obviously I wasn't like, mm. um, I started writing it myself though, because I was going through a, a hard time with like family and stuff and home. And um, my English teacher, she was like, oh, you're really interested and you're good at this. And there was this poetry competition um, to be published in this young, piece, uh, young person's anthology. And it got published, and I was like, oh, okay, maybe I'm a little bit good at this. Um, so I started paying more attention, and then Ideas Tap was around at that time, and the Mac was going to do this, I think it's six or three month program of training with young people. It was called Future Poets Festival, and you would be a producer, so you'd produce this festival, but at the same time, you'd get trained by industry professionals in the poetry and spoken word scene and yeah that training like completely changed my life exposed me to some of the great industry experts who are still like willing to help 
and like they're like hey and I'm just like I remember we were gonna have a master class with polar bear at the time and I did not know anything about spoken word or who who are big names and stuff like that. I just remember when the guys on the course being like, how the hell do you not know who this is? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm just here to learn. <laughs> like, I think there's a weird thing in this culture where people can't admit they don't know things. And it's like, well, sometimes I don't know and I don't know until I know. Um, and just getting exposed to all of that and having my talent cultivated and it, with, with drama or acting, you don't get to, um, you get creative license, but you don't get a wide range unless you're the writer, d director. You get to make a few character choices, and but even then you have to wait for a production to come along for you to get casted so you can get stuck in. Whereas writing, it's instant for me if I want to pluck something from my mind or still, so I'm still very politically active um, in regards to like, race relations, socioeconomic things, uh, feminism. So I can still, I can write, I can get it out there straight away and it and having those conversations of change, change with people. So yeah, um, one gives me the chance to just be like, explore the truth and one gets me to be able to have the conversations that I think are important for society to advance with other people or just talk about heartbreak. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit more about your political activism then? Um, yeah, so obviously I did all the things with Youth Parliament and I'm like, whoa, okay, the world seems to be getting a little bit more unfair as we go along. Um, and then I genuinely, genuinely didn't, like, pay attention. I just, I don't know. You know when people that walk around and they're like, I'm woke. I won't say that. And I, 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 th I think I'm getting conscious. I still haven't like scratched the surface of how, how like messed up things are. But I genuinely remember when, like up until I was like 14 and stuff, thinking that the world was fair and that everyone was equal, that you just had to work hard and that things would be fine. And as I go on, I'm just like, whoa, no, because you have all of these systematic oppressions and socioeconomic factors in there that like predetermine some people's lives and it doesn't matter how hard they work and until we start having these narratives of discussions then nothing's going to change um so i've worked with um artivist which is my friend's company and um the Impact Hub in Birmingham, who have a lot of festivals, so I produce sometimes. So last October, we had a festival called Decolonize, Not Diversify, which is looking at the fact that, yeah, we have diversity, but is that really helping anyone look where we are in the world right now? And what we need to actually do is educate ourselves and decolonize our minds, and that's from everybody. So. That's where I'm at, and I'm actually educating my st myself at the moment, um, doing African studies through an independent organisation, going into communities and talking to people and just tr trying to understand where all these biases come from, looking at the media and things like that. And then there's obviously also being a woman, the intersectionalities of that, and then... Yeah, there's so much work to be done, yeah, and it's just working with organisations with either writing for them as a copywriter, doing poetry, or running workshops, or help producing and bringing other people who say what needs to be said, or do what needs to be done better than I ever could. Can you tell me about how your poetry has been um, affected by your experience of migration? Um... My poetry has been formed um, from my experiences, from when I'm reflecting or if I've been commissioned. So um, I have a piece that I'll read for you guys called Reactionary Heart, and it was a commission on what it feels like to be a citizen of the city but not be the stereotypical image of it and why it feels like home. And 
like I said, Birmingham's always felt like home. It's I think it's a magical city. There are people who are from here and they're like, I hate it. Oh my god, what's wrong with it? And I'm like, it's because you're not you're not going to the right places. You're not meeting the right people. Obviously, if you like, I don't know, because my school was located out in like Erdington slash King Standing, and like if you're staying up here, just up here, and you're not getting involved with the cool things, and you're not coming into the city, or you're not making things happen because the library up there across our school is one of my favorite places to hang out and they had loads of cool things for like women's day or um black history month and like competitions they'd run and it's like well if you're just staying in your own bubble and i don't know going to the chippy and then going back home of course you're going to think nothing happens in the city so yeah let me just read the poem and you'll see why just like the river goddess fountain renamed Floozy in the Jacuzzi by locals and Lady in Waitings by me and my friends, we are a city of misconceptions from inside and out. Our city council likes to boast that we're one of the most multicultural cities in the UK, second to London again. Another phrase that likes to get thrown about is melting pot. Melting pots aren't real, they're an overused, unwashed metaphor, society is becoming more homogenous, melting together into a harmonious whole with one common culture. We are anything but common. We are not a melting pot and there's nothing wrong with that. We enjoy the pockets of people stitched together. Difference is celebrated and explored. Come Monday morning, we all wake to the hustle and bustle, dragging our bodies out onto this city street. March to the throng of the beating heart based in the centre. What we are more like is a stadium named after a conqueror, where athletes come to be remembered, where the chanting of the home crowd is echoed on the walls. Birmingham, Birmingham, Birmingham. We are a Sikh man standing in the pews of the city centre chapel, bathed by the sunlight of stained glass windows. Here, faith is a factor only if you want it to be. They call us second city, but we're second to none. First class when it comes to community. I know firsthand how welcoming you can be, Birmingham. Interloper at six, local at 20. I know firsthand that you are home. When I was still Caribbean green and had an accent that tasted of ripe mangoes and forever summers, didn't try and wash the sea from me. Instead, you offered right of way on your multiple canals, endless opportunities to meet people born and bred here, others who flock here. Always infinite enlightenment like you did for the 18th century lunar society. Our accents may be mocked, but who cares? We know the truth. We are not simple and slow. And even if we were, our quick hearts would more than make up for it. At the beginning of the interview, um, you reflected on your wide family heritage. Can you um, describe that a little bit more? Yeah, so it's a weird one. Um, It's mostly going back into the generations. Um, With my parents, I'm like fully... Jamaican I would say um but on my mother's side which I know more of the history um like my great great grandmother she was in Spanish and she was really weird although she was married to a black man she had colorism racism issues so she wouldn't teach her children Spanish but she would teach other people in the community Spanish and it was like huh okay then and I have another poem that um looks into our heritage and um, on a, still on my mother's side, um, her dad, my grandmother's dad, he's a um, descendant of white Scottish, so it's knowing directly that... So the farmlands that we owned um, obviously come from that part, and you think, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it's basically a plantation. <laughs> you basically... You're basically married to the slave owner so it's that intersectionality of coming from the oppressor and the oppressed and it's it's a weird mind frame to be in and thinking oh I don't I don't know I don't know if I've come to terms with that yet um but yeah I'm trying to be in a space where I'm just like people that did what they did at the times that they did them because of the society they lived in but i don't i just think it's really bizarre and it's an interesting um 
heritage but i don't think i'd ever claim like i don't know if someone's like oh yeah you're african inherently and i'm like yeah sure that's cool i just need to find out more about like what tribes and uh, nations we come from but i wouldn't think of doing the same for like scotland or spain i don't know yeah So you said you'd uh, written a poem about your um, family's heritage. Would you mind reading it out to us? Um, yeah, um, the poem's called Stardust Bloodbath. Follow the bloodlines, percolating metallic silver soaking into the earth, emerald green glinting and rubbing rubies, they bleed into each other. I am the Lord's living quilt, call me melting pot. The patchwork of pigments that is my skin is their story. The story of colonisation and displacement. Two things, when you think about it, really aren't so far from each other. The oppressor quashes his own soul in a bid to render your spirit to his bidding. The weeping of my family tree tells the story of a Spanish woman who feared the melanin in her children's skin. Is it because it spoke of her sin, her lustful undoing? She raised her children perched up on high on a white stonewashed veranda, wide hat brimming out to block out the Jamaican sun, trying to remain as pale as possible. As for the children, they were not allowed to play in the day. The sun had to be set in the sky before they could run and scream. I think a sense of her denial still lingers in me. Then there's the Scotsman that ran away with a slave girl. As a child, I was told I should be thankful for the red rust of my hair his jean beseeched me. I'm more grateful for the dark brown the sun has oxidized it. Finally, we have the slave girl. Never born to be such a thing, but thing is what you become when white men deemed they could steal and buy you. Your original homeland, I do not know. I romanticized her and the Scotsman, the ultimate slaves to love. These complex cosmic creatures really do make me believe that each of us are the breath of specks of exploded stars. There are many more stories in this quilt. One day I will track them down and wring them out. But when the Rasta man confuses me for Kenyan, I am not offended. Is that where you're from, slave girl? When the black kids say I'm not black enough, I will try not to be offended at their ignorance. When the white kids ask me why I'm not black enough, I will try not to be offended at their ignorance. If more people hunted down their heritage instead of resting easy in the colour of their skin to tell them where they're from, the world would be a better place because they would realise we're all melting pots. We have both been the oppressor and oppressed, and one day you'll just be another stitch in someone's quilt. Can you tell me um, about your hopes for the future of Birmingham? At the moment, um, I'm really proud of the city, but I'm scared for it at the same time. Um, I'm proud that we're one of the fastest growing economically during the downturn and that we're redeveloping and they're fixing the city and they're pumping money into us. But at the same time, those very same things are what are making it scary. And I can see it by looking outside my own window due to gentrification and people being displaced and moved out. They're always like um, cities when they're trying to reach a certain level of prestige instead of trying to raise everybody economically they're like let's just push the poor people out instead of helping everyone progress and things like the bin strikes it's it's just ridiculous and it's like how are you trying to bid for the commonwealth how are you try to bring all these skyscrapers but you can't pick up the rubbish yeah so uh, hopefully it's just getting to a point where they listen to their citizens more pay the bin men a freaking fair wage i know that sounds simplistic but sometimes we don't make things as complicated because we do have all this money and they're behaving like we don't so i hope our city can come to a good sense of community cohesion and level everybody up because the homelessness and that's rising by 20 percent doesn't doesn't look good and i don't want the city i loved and thought gave so many opportunities to turn into this shiny stop off point that's just for Londoners and rich people that's not what we're about and finally can you tell um describe to me what you think it is to be a Brummie 
Mm. Uh, oh, warm. Yeah, that's the word I'd put it. To be a Brummie is to be like a warm person. Because when you go to other cities, it's just like either too slow and everything's shot by like 5 a.m. Or the other extreme, London, where it's like non stop, non stop, people are just rude and it's like hitting you. And Birmingham just seems to be that lovely middle ground of things are happening, it's sticking over, it's really cool. But people still have like a sense of camaraderie, manners, and they're just warm and nice. And it's like, no, I don't know, just like the random old lady, like I told you about at the beginning, just like popping over my fence and it's like, here you are, bab. It's just, it's just warm. <laughs> yeah.